getting quiet. Ah, you can hear me now. I can hear myself. Hello, Utah. I ran B-Sides Texas for six years. If I got that wimpy response, come on now. It's three o'clock. Get the blood flowing. Hello, Utah. Better, better. So I'm in healthcare, and uh, one of the things my, uh, my boss requires me to ask everybody to do is to uh, do the little healthcare stretch before a talk. So what I need everybody to do is stand up, stretch, kind of do their things. Uh, I gotta get a picture to prove that I, I did this. And then one of the things he says is really good to do, he says bring arms together, gets that blood flowing. He said, that's great, that's great, just keep doing that. Great, now I can tell him you gave me a standing ovation, perfect. All right, so why are we here? Well, one of the reasons is because of this. Uh, if you don't know who Brian Gribbs is, this won't be funny to you. If you do know who he is, then it should be funny to you. So, um, so yes, because nobody wants to be on Krebs' list and be reported that they've been compromised. Let's see if this thing will stay up there on its own. So how many people here want to learn about how to catch hackers using their logging? Everybody in the room, hopefully that's why you're here. My name is Michael Goff. I am a uh, blue team defender. And this talk is basically logging for hackers. So what do we need to do? How do we need to repair? I, I believe talks in conferences like this, especially blue team talks, need to be actionable. What I mean by that is something you can actually take back to work and do. In this case, this talk specifically also, which you can take back and do to your mom and dad. So I would like everybody to give a warm welcome to the first time they've ever seen me present in InfoSec. My parents happen to be attending here because they live here. So give them a warm welcome. <laughs> And uh, if you heard the ransomware talk earlier, uh, he talked about uh, doing things to protect mom and dad. Well, this actually would be a good talk. Uh, the talk will give you good materials that you could actually do this. And, and I actually will be, when I go back to their house here Friday, uh, doing this to their laptops to make sure they haven't picked up any bad uh, foo. So we'll go with that. So who am I? I'm a blue team defender, a malware archaeologist, as I've been uh, dubbed, because I like to play with malware. And I studied archaeology in college, so uh, it's a good fit there. Um, I love properly configured logs. I'm a logaholic. Hello, my name is Michael. I'm a logaholic. Thank you. <laughs> We've got to have interaction, right? It's late in the day. Got to keep you going. But properly configured logs tell us who, what, where, when, and how a hack happened. And I fought the Chinese for three years uh, in the gaming industry, and everything I thought I knew got applied in this case. And so I'm going to share with you, and you're actually going to see some of the, the artifacts from these attacks. Um, because we did good logging, it allowed us to detect this, and so I'm here to share that information with you. I'm also the creator of the malware management framework. Everybody knows what vulnerability management is, right? You read vulnerability reports, you go patch your systems. Malware management is similar. You read malware reports, breach reports, and you look for the cool artifact, and you go implement that in the security tools. Ah, I'm not looking for this condition of bits being misused, so I'm going to look for that condition in my environment. That's the concept of malware management. And I also authored several Windows logging cheat sheets. So anybody here ever used the Windows logging cheat sheets before? I can see some hands. You're definitely going to know what they are. That's one of the takeaways today. And then um, I'm the co-creator of LogMD. I'm a walking billboard with the shirt and everything, plenty of sayings. Um, and that was also co-developed. How many people here have listened to Breaking Down Security, the podcast? Some hands, so if you haven't, please do. The co-host, Brian Betcher, is my partner with LogMD. And then Hacker Hurricane is my Twitter handle and also my blog, so you can follow some information about what I do. So why listen to me? Uh, for those that are in the gaming industry, you would know these reports. WinNTI was an attack against the gaming industry, uh, not just the company I worked for, but all the gaming industry, uh, led by the Chinese. And we discovered this attack hitting our organization uh, in May 2012, and if you notice, it May 2013 or April 2013 is when this report got released by Kaspersky. Our company was named in there. It actually wasn't our company that was attacked or successfully hacked. It was a partner running the game because there's this publishing and all this sort of stuff that happens in gaming. And so we discovered this beforehand. And the other cool thing in 2014, uh, when we got a hit again, we had given to one of the big IR firms, I won't mention them because everybody has a bad day, an infected VM, uh, artifacts of which I'm going to share with you in this presentation. And they came back and said, yep, it's clean. So of course, me and my partner at the time jumped up and down and said, woo, we're better than they are. It was a really winning scenario. But it proved how valuable the information I'm about to share with you is in regards to detecting these kinds of attacks. 
and also save money because we got rid of the IR firm much quicker than normally would occur. And of course, because you want to catch these guys, if you've been to uh, DerbyCon or several cons uh, where these guys present, Dave Kennedy, Ben Ten, Carlos Perez, um, these are the elite of our industry. Friends of mine, matter of fact, Carlos Perez has a Metasploit module specifically looking at the logging that I'm about to talk to you about. And so they, their job is to try to break into systems that I defend and, and we defend systems they try to break into. And I'm going to share with you some of the ways to, to catch these guys. So Darwin says we must evolve. Things evolve. Well, we better evolve because in the course of malware, it is evolving. So if we don't evolve, we're going to die. Well, in the case of malware, if you don't evolve, you're going to get breached anyways. And you're going to get an RGE. Anybody know what an RGE is? Resume generating event. So what's the first thing you do when you get compromised, your company gets compromised? I, this is not a joke. This is serious. Update your resume, right? Because unfortunately, these breaches do cause resume generating events. If you've, if you've ever been involved with a breach, you'll realize somebody will at some point or multiple people will get terminated. And so for those of us who do IR, like myself, uh, resumes are always up to date. So let's look at some quick stats. Why are we here? Well, because according to the DBIR report, if you don't read the Verizon DB, DBIR report, you should, because the information in there kind of gives you a glimpse of what most companies are reporting they do and what happened to them. In this case, we know that hackers compromise their systems in a matter of minutes, right? They get a piece of malware in a box and they own that box in a matter of minutes. And then they poke around and in a matter of days, they're compromising your data. They're starting to exfil all that data. Our goal here, and what this talk is trying to address, is our ability to catch this area within hours. Compromised machine, there's no reason why you can't catch the compromise within a couple hours before the data exfils, thus causing the RGE. And unfortunately, uh, hackers' time to compromise is growing at a faster rate than our ability to catch them, which means the gap is widening. Yes, we're getting better, but they're getting better faster. Hashes. In the old days, a malware would infect me, the same malware hash would affect everybody here. Today, the malware hash I get is different than the one he gets, the one he gets, the one he gets. And according to the DBIR, they're lasting about 58 seconds. That's the life of a malware hash these days, the unique signature of the file. And unfortunately, that means because they're, hash they're, they're changing these hashes, you can't go looking for your system for the hash you found on my box, because it's going to be different than the hash on your box. So that means it's evolving at a rate that makes detection and discovery very difficult and it's increasing. Look at the big jump from almost nothing to huge changes. So th their industry has evolved incredibly fast. Semantic says we have over one million new, or last guy was from Semantic here, one million new threats into the wild each day. I'd like to see you chase that. It's like a runaway train. Not going to happen. San says Word documents using macros are more commonly used. How many people here have seen word macro viruses in their environment? Pretty much everybody's hand's going to go up if they want to admit it. Sophos says, and this is the case of APT, Sophos says 70% of malware is unique to one company. That means if they're targeting, targeting you, you're that 70%. If they're targeting an industry like gaming, that's 80% of all malware. And there's roughly 600 million mal new pieces of malware each year developed by, by malwareians and the bad guys. So really what that means is AV's addressing 20% of the industry because that's what we're seeing in email and web drive buys, right? It's the stuff they see the most of. It's the stuff that, that everybody in this room is getting, not the unique one attack on a company or the unique industry attack. And that's where AV fits in. So there's a lot of malware out there that's unique to us. And I'm sure in the course of this many people in this room, all of you will have had a unique attack in your environment. You may or may not have detected it. So let's look at some artifacts. This is some artifacts that came out of the WinNTI Chinese attack against the company I worked for. These are logs. Don't worry about reading these right now. I have posted these on a link to my website, malwarearchaeology.com. I understand Kelly will also have these available through the Saint Con materials um, and also SlideShare if you, just, if you just go on SlideShare and look for Malware Archaeology. These are study slides for you. These are help, to help you go back and convince your managers to start doing what we're about to learn, okay? So don't worry about not being able to read these. But here in this chunk of log is a malware launch. Here, they're hiding a payload in the registry, which is a very unique thing for these high-end attacks. And here, they're modifying a service. Not installing a new service, modifying a service. And again, they check the service used. They escalate the privilege. They modify the permissions to make it harder for me to clean it up and also to hide it from our ability to see it. 
as well as they're pushing it out to other systems, right? The compromised one machine, they immediately start hiding it on that box, pushing it out to other machines and continuing their efforts. They use the registry for storage. Why is it cool for storage? It's a huge database. The registry can hide things you would never be able to find them in all the keys and all the values and all the data that's in there. They then change the permissions, again, making it harder for us to remediate the problem, make it hard for the IR people, make it hard for the administrators. Also just to hide the stuff from basic tools that we use every day. And then they change the permissions on the files, again, to hide the stuff they just hid in the registry. So again, the Chinese are very good at this, Russians are no different. Bad behavior, though, fortunately becomes obvious when you look at logs because you can see that they're doing recon, executing uh, netstat commands, and querying users, and all those sorts of things that they do. And they're also going after terminal services. Why? Because they want to be able to remote into any of the machines in the environment. And so they know what they're going after. They're skilled at this. And we have to be able to find that because we don't know what they're doing. In this case, here they are querying the user. Now, if you're good at, if you're good at uh, catching logs like we're about to learn and the, the way you go about it, um, we can even get as good as they are because in this case, here we are catching the credentials they use to log into the CNC within our environment. And now we, gave, we captured their password, which allowed us to log in to the CNC they had within our environment that all the systems were talking to. So again, we caught their credentials, not them catching ours. Now the cool thing about WinNTI and the Chinese is they avoided the new service persistence they did before because they utilized the registry. And they utilized uh, public directories to initially drop the files because again, they don't have to worry about who owns those. Everybody does. And then they started doing these long scripts. Okay, the behavior that they type at the command line becomes very obvious that this is not your administrator. And in here, you can see that they had a reference to a registry key. Uh, this logging is what allowed us to go in and see the Chinese attack and know exactly what artifacts and where they were coming from. And here's what the key looked like when we actually went to the key. There were three values, put, file, file, and read. And in here, in this encrypted bits of data, they, uh, one of the machines did not properly completely infect and so the code in there said 4D5A, and I know what that is, that's MZ and hex, and so therefore this is their binary hidden in the registry. Very clever because there really are no tools to look in the registry for stored binaries. Persistence, they got really clever here. They infected, they had two infectors, an exe, infect exe and infect sys.exe. Now one was infect using a driver and the other one was in fact using a, a binary. Now the binary one was really interesting because they went after our antivirus service, McAfee framework service, and our big fix BES client helper. What that meant is they infected the binary, it still functioned exactly as expected, but they added the ability to read that registry key, decrypt it, drop it onto disk to the to the service that they had modified that I mentioned a few slides ago, and then the malware infected the machine and then it deleted that file on disk. So when the system was live, we saw no living artifacts on disk or, or, uh, or from the key, right? The key said, it, the file's over here, well the file wasn't there because they had taken out a registry, decrypted it, dropped it on disk, executed and deleted it. They tried it on a few others but it failed. The cool thing is we used BigFix to actually find this condition across our organization. So there's a big plug for BigFix. And to verify that this is the case, we booted up Procmon, Process Monitor by SysInternals. If you're not familiar with this tool, uh, definitely do get familiar with it. And here's the best client helper service, creating the file wlxsys64.sys. Again, you can see this in detail when you download the presentation. And so this is the, the proof that we knew that best client helper, helper was writing this file that was actually the back door that they were utilizing. So bam, we got gotcha. you. And that gave us everything we needed to know about how these, this infection with WinNTI occurred. So let's look at what we're seeing in commodity artifacts today. Uh, Kovter had a unique thing that's occurred, and uh, we've seen this a couple other times, um, but this is really cool because all they had to do is write a null entry, a null bit entry into the value of a key. Now why that's important is, as you can see by the error on this slide, is that when you launch regedit to go look at a key, which all of us do when we're looking for malware, we go to the auto run key, in this case the run key. It threw an error because regedit can't interpret that null byte and it fails and it doesn't show you the value that actually launches the malware. Also, if you did a reg query at the command line, it didn't work either. So that's a unique piece of information. The commodity malware just kicked up its game. This is, this is the 20% I talk about that everybody gets. So suddenly we have no way to detect this condition other than we know this error is being thrown when you manually go look. And there it is in the run key and you get an error. 
Now dry decks, uh, pretty typical of most, uh, Vautrac do, does this as well. They drop a series of files, a bunch of these. This is an executable, a JPEG. A JPEG is a config file, not actually a JPEG, though it is an image of Google. It was the configuration data below the image that they were uh, dropping in the box. They use batch files, they use VB files, and PowerShell files. Now why is that? Because AV does not detect scripts, and then scripts are easily morphed into something different. What we see with Vautrac now, if you open up one of the VB script files out of this Vautrac malware, you have no idea what it says. They randomize it with all these funny words, and it's really humorous to try to read what these scripts do. And these are three variants of Drydex, and so they consistently, every infection, we're rotating it. As a matter of fact, in the end of 2015, the Drydex that we got on a machine uh, that we were playing with in a lab and put on this machine, every time we rebooted it, it not only changed the hash of the file, it changed the file name and the directory in which it wrote back to every time the system shut down. So that was a, a pretty interesting artifact. Again, commodity malware doing this. And here's the uh, information about the 2015. So as the system boots up, it reads the uh, run key, loads the malware, deletes. So when I go to research the system, there's nothing there. There's no run key, there's no file. But yet when I shut down and go into safe mode or use another tool that looks for this condition or good logging, then when it boots back up, I can see that the reg key was created, that the file was dropped, and then it was deleted on startup because that got recorded because we do good logging and auditing on those keys and file locations. So that's a fairly new thing. Here's the temp file with the funny string to execute, and here's a showing where it's deleting the registry value. And again, commodity malware acting like some of this advanced malware, getting tricky to stay behind. In 2016, we saw Dryadex come back a little bit, where now, instead of using executable binaries, they're using DLLs, and they're using run DLL32 to install it, and this is gibberish to us, because we just see run DLL32 in some cryptic string. Okay, and so that's another way to obfuscate what we're looking for. But again, with good logging, we were able to see this and, and track it down and say, ah, let's figure out what this is. Reboot the box a few times and, and see what was going on. So how do we detect this malicious behavior? Takeaway number one. Remember I said stuff should be actionable. Stuff you want to remember and take home. You can research what I just showed you and study it. But this is what you want to remember. Again, what am I supposed to set? You talk about good logging, so what am I supposed to set? Well, I've authored five cheat sheets, the Windows Logging Cheat Sheet set, and so that's what you go read. The Windows Logging Cheat Sheets are available at malwarearchaeology.com. They're free. Uh, it's a public community thing. I believe in the community. Uh, those of us that have experienced need to share this information because I need to make more of you look like me and act like me because it's really hard to find good IR people. And so we need to share this information to make everybody better and try to get that gap between the... Uh, them getting better and us getting better, get it smaller. So there's a Windows Logging Cheat Sheet, Core Windows Logging, what you're supposed to do. There's the File Auditing Cheat Sheet. So unfortunately in Windows, you have to then go pick directories that you want to actually turn on auditing for after you've enabled the bit to record auditing. And also the same for the registry. So there's a registry cheat sheet that has all the auto run locations that, that we feel you should uh, capture in your audits. And then for those that are Splunkers, I, I presented at Splunk.conf uh, last year and I released the Splunk logging cheat sheet. This is an example of some queries. No matter what log management solution you can do, what you use or what you have, you can convert these Splunk queries into your solution to look for these kinds of things. And we're going to talk about some of those. PowerShell. How many people here do any PowerShell work in their environment? Lots of hands. Now, of those people with their hands up, how many people do logging of PowerShell? Yeah, one hand, two. <laughs> PowerShell is here in a big way. Why did Drydex use it? Why does Vautrac use it? Why do the pen testers use it? Because logging is awful by default in Windows. Matter of fact, it's non-existent. If you don't go out of your way to turn it on, it, there's nothing to log. It's even worse in version 2 and 3, got better in version 4, and they, Microsoft made huge strides in version 5. And so again, these guys have written tools specifically to do all PowerShell exploitation. So it's important that we now focus on PowerShell logging. Thus, uh, and again, by default, Windows is kind of terrible at logging in general. So takeaway number two, the Windows PowerShell Logging Cheat Sheet. We just released it this year, and again, it helps you bridge the gap. Um, this isn't just information that came from me. I did seek out uh, feedback from Lee Holmes, from Ben 10, from uh, Devin Kerr, uh, and uh, Matt uh, Manifestation also gave feedback to this cheat sheet. So I asked some of the industry experts that write and work in PowerShell, Lee Holmes is on the Microsoft team, the write PowerShell, said, give me your feedback. What are we missing here? 
So again, if you want to catch the guys I mentioned about and the bad guys moving forward, start getting these settings set. But you will need PowerShell 5 or PowerShell 4 with a, with a KB patch. And 5 gives you a lot more than 4 does. So I would definitely start moving your organizations to PowerShell 5. Takeaway number three, enable command line logging. All that stuff I ripped through really quick, the reason we caught that 2014 attack by the Chinese was because uh, uh, Microsoft had turned on uh, command line logging by default in Windows 8.1 and our administrators decided they wanted the coolest, latest uh, OS and so they installed it on a bunch of workstations. And fortunately our new game was deployed in Windows Server 2012 and it was built into that so when I enabled it, we are able to catch the Chinese typing all those commands. It was what led us to actually capturing them. They almost didn't set off any of the alarms that they had done in 2012 because they completely changed their mode of operations in 2014. And command line logging, all that stuff I showed you, is what caught that. Yes, you will potentially catch usernames and passwords. You should catch usernames and passwords and go talk to those people and tell them, stop doing it this way. Net use space, U colon username space, P colon password. Don't do that. Net use, splat, whack, whack, some location. Username may be okay if it's generic, and then wait for it to prompt you for a password. If you have to script something, find a different way to do it. So yes, you potentially will expose credentials. That's okay. It's better by far as far as eliminating risk than it is to deal with some lost creds. And by the way, you could always tell your log management not to collect that unique command line or turn it off on that one box, which I don't recommend. But this is your third takeaway. If you're gonna do anything, go enable process create 4688 and turn on this reg key or GPO to capture command line logging, because that's how you catch the APT and commodity attacks. In this particular attack, you can count the fact that there are six commands that the bad guys executed. C script, they, they mentioned a reference to key in the course of, of updating that key. They used a script, which they, instead of using VBS, they renamed it .ax. They used worse CPL support as the service uh, that, they, that they compromised to point to the bad executable. They did a net stop. They did a command slash CC script. They did a uh, push D. And they also did a take on because they were taking ownership of the files. All these commands, uh, along with the script, are the behavior that we're looking for because I defy you to show me an administrator that acts this way. Okay, they don't. When you watch your administrators hacking all the things they do, it will never look like an advanced attack or even a commodity attack by any stretch. It is, it is as big a gap as, as, as you saw on the scale when I talked about them getting ba better, faster than we are. So command line is by far the coolest thing and is the best improvement. And it's only been here since 2016, uh, 2015, excuse me, for Windows 7 and 2008 server. It was built into 8.1 in 2012. If you're a Splunker or log management in general, this query is what triggered us to the 2014 attack. So all I'm doing here is I'm looking at all the administrative utilities that are in Windows, and I'm saying, okay, every time they trigger, and it creates a log entry, in this case 4688, and I'm doing a stats count, I'm counting them, when it exceeds two, so on the third command, alert me to that, and then it spits out all the commands that they are typing, which is what those slides I showed you at the beginning of it occurred. This is the number one query for your log management. And yes, I'm a Splunk fan, but uh, any log management that can do this. If you, by the way, if you want to decide whether or not to buy a solution, if your log management can do this kind of stuff, buy it. A great qualifier. So how do you do this? Well, malware management, right? I talked about that a little bit at the beginning. Um, that basically you want to read these reports, look at the cool artifacts that are in there and say, ah, and that's what I do with Splunk. It's like, I don't look for that condition, so I'm going to write a Splunk query to look for that condition. Oh, wait, I need to turn on this logging. Let's go turn on this logging. And that's basically the cycle that occurs with malware management. Malware discovery is nothing more than us going out and trying to find it. Some people call this hunt teaming. Some people call this active defense. Um, I call it malware discovery, thus log MD, log and malicious discovery. And then malware analysis, looking at the malware and the artifacts, give us the details that we needed. So that's how we do and IR and hunt teaming. This is basically what we do. So what we all need to look for. Turn on your logs and configure it. Command line details. Admin tools misused. This is going to be the number one thing. The one thing when you go talk to Carlos Perez or Ben Ten or Dave Kennedy or any of us pen testers in the room, 
when I finally get you to click on that phishing email, which is generally how they go after you when they're trying, if that's on the table for the pen test, is you are going to detonate some binary and they're in. So assume that's going to happen, right? Assume compromise. And now what's going to happen from there? Well, Ben 10 is going to use PowerShell up the kazoo, which is why you have to turn on PowerShell logging. And SET, the social engineering toolkit, is going to use PowerShell. And Carlos Perez is going to use PowerShell. But they're also going to type in net use to connect to another machine to push their payload. And they're going to remote detonate with WMI and all the things they're going to do. And they're going to fill your logs with all kinds of goodness that allow you to catch them. If you turn on file auditing, you're going to catch file hashes that are unique, dropped in certain locations, thus why the file auditing cheat sheets. You'll see the deletes and startups and shutdown if you turn on registry auditing in certain key auto runs locations. Scripts hidden, obviously, in the registry. You saw me show that with the WinNTI stuff. We see that with Coveter. We're seeing this uh, with Vautrack, where they're hiding payloads. We had one piece of Vautrack, for some odd reason, very unique, that had four different pieces of persistence on the box. They used the startup location in the program folder, they used the run key, they used a service, and they used an explorer services key. Um, and they stored all this in the registry. Malware communication, IP. Now NetFlow gives you Bob talk to Alice, but it doesn't say this application on Bob's machine talk to Alice. That's what I'm after as an IR guy, because I need to know what it is and what it did to go find what's infected on the rest of your machines. So I need to know the malware named A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or whatever they named it, because they're always funky named these days, or WinHost, as the case of uh, the last Vautrack came across, that do you have WinHost 32 with this hash and this location on your box? And then I can seek out that information. Right? So I need to know the actual binary. And the Windows Firewall gives you that. The Windows Firewall will tell you the name of the process that executed and the IP source and destination. So more than NetFlow can give you, and it's on the host. For those that say, ah, I can't block anything in the enterprise with Windows Firewall, you can put it in any, any mode and just record the information. I recommend an OU, drop the machines you want to investigate into that OU, it enables the Windows Firewall, puts it in any, any mode, and now I can see this information in the logs. Reboot the box, and you're going to see any of the persistence that starts up and, and talks out. It's awesome. And of course, expand PowerShell detection. That's another key point here. Uh, you've got to start your organizations getting down the path of upgrading to PowerShell 5, even if you're on Windows 7. But you have to move down this path because these guys are developing PowerShell uh, software big time and fast. And then VirusTotal lookups. All of us use VirusTotal. We upload it to see if anybody ever known anything about it before or if it's a known trusted good file. So these are the things we want to look for. So what do we take away from all this? Well, you have three options. Do nothing, which will lead to an RGE and hopefully why you're here, right? You want to learn what to do. Log management or SIM. Well, I don't, how many people here have a nice budget where they can spend 100,000 bucks or 200,000 if you're talking about Splunk on log management, right? And I don't see any hands because the light's pretty bright. But again, what else can you do? It is the best option. I have a top 10 list of tools. Log management's number one, big fix kind of tool, uh, not for patching, but for the analysis and fix like capability. Tanium would be a similar kind of product. I suppose you might throw SSCM in there, but there's a lot of limitations in SSCM. LogMD would be th third, and then four through 10 are blank. Because the hackers all know about 11 through 100, and that's your CrowdStrike, Silence, and all that, and all the tools are all vendor vendors up here. It's the non-security tools that did the best at catching the Chinese. They bypassed our IDS. They bypassed our tripwire. And I can talk to you about what that bypass is offline. They bypassed our antivirus. Well, they all bypass antivirus. They bypassed our, uh, our scanners. They bypassed everything. Why? They buy the same technology we do because they afford it. Ransomware, we heard the numbers of how much money they made. They can afford to buy all the technology they want to test their products to get by security tools. That's why log management and configuration management tools like BigFix are so valuable. So what if you don't have a SIM? How many people here don't have a SIM? I should see almost the entire room's hands go up here, barely with the lights. Most of us don't. And if we don't, if we do have it, we're not configuring it to collect all these things. Uh, John Strand often says, uh, logging vendors are lying to you. They want you to collect all the things because they want to sell you more license. You can collect all the things, tweak it to the right things, and then it becomes a very valuable tool. And the, and the bad guys really can't mess with it because if they turn off logging, everybody in the organization is going to notice. Plus, I would just rotate the logs. That would be the best way. So this solution of what do I use if I don't have log management uh, didn't exist. So as the outcome of, of WinNTI 
And our malware analysis to try to speed it up in the lab, the organization I'm currently with now in healthcare, um, I went to lunch with a friend of mine, and uh, this is your fourth takeaway in this talk, is the LogMD, the Log and Malicious Discovery Tool. There was not a tool that I could run on a system to tell me what the state of the logging was at, nor give me a report to say, set these things. So I very quickly couldn't do that. I would get calls from some professionals and say, hey, can you help me out with a compromise? And I'd call the people and they're like, well, do you have this? Do you have this? No, I don't know. I don't know. I got a lot of I don't knows. So I'm like, I would love a tool I could email them that just run this. It's going to create a report. Send the report back to me. I'll tell you what to set. Get your IT guys to set it. Reboot the boxes you think are infected. Run it again. Generate some, and boom, send me back some reports. This is what LogMD was designed for. By the way, it's free. So you're about to learn about a free tool that's about to make your life a lot, a lot easier if you're IT or InfoSec. So again, we now have something that will check not only what the Windows Logging Cheat Sheets, LogMD will compare your system's configuration not only to the Windows Logging Cheat Sheets, which by far the, the most detailed of all logging configurations, but also the Aussie standards, the Aussie cyber standards, also the USGCBs, as well as the Center for Internet Security Benchmarks. It's in a plain text report. I used to be a consultant, so it's designed to be pulled out of this report, which is a text file, to put into my nice Word document to say, hey, Mr. Customer, or hey, Mr. Manager, we need to set these things. So now we have a tool to monitor uh, how the thing's set. We know what to set, and now we know how to check for it. The audit report has lots of good information in it. It also tells you all the reg keys and settings you need to change or to improve your logging. Okay, and this is what it compares against. Here's an example of what it looks like. Really straightforward. You can format it all you want because everybody has their own ways. And you can see over here we even have some notes on the far right side, um, some specific notes at the bottom of the report. It has some key where you can see why. Some of these are new, new for Windows 8, for example. The latest version of LogMD has some new Windows 10. The anniversary update added three new, new uh, audit settings if you're not familiar with them. And so we had to take that into account on the product. So it, it lists that on the side. But this is your advanced audit settings in Windows. Whether it's GPO set or locally set, doesn't matter. When you run LogMD, it'll give you a summary of reports. So once you, once you get the logging enabled and it starts collecting the logs and it completes, you're going to see the reports that they do. You're going to see the main reports, a big, wide, long spreadsheet with all the data, and you'll see a whitelist it out. Okay? There's a lot of noise in Windows logs, so is there a way for me to whitelist it out so next time I run this I don't see that? Yes, we give you a whitelist and those settings go into the whitelisted out. So you can start making that, that output on the machines for your unique environment stick out to you. We have a file and registry auditing. If you turn on file and registry auditing per the cheat sheets that I have provided and offer up a malware archaeology, you can start collecting this information when you analyze a machine. And again, if you don't set this to GPO, it's often someone will bring a machine not configured. I will manually configure that. I will reboot the box to get everything working the way I want it. The persistence of the malware will kick off, and then I'll run LogMD to collect it, and then I'll see all these reg key deletions or weird things that occur, because I'll go flip the bits on the auditing real quick. Yeah, 30 minutes real quick anyway. It is a manual process unless you use GPO. Firewall policy modifications. This is a big one. Malware infects your machines, you find the malware, you delete the malware, but did you ever check the firewall policy logs to see if they opened up the back door to explore? So now when you're at Starbucks, your explorer is wide open to everybody? Very common thing for these commodity advanced malwares to do. Also process started. These are the 4688s. What launched on this box? Well, it's pretty unusual when you see ransomware or any, any payload that detonates out of AppData Local or AppData Roaming. If you've got AppData Roaming, some oddball name.exe, guaranteed bad. So it points that sort of stuff out. What started? And again, you can whitelist this out. So all your normal utilities and things that your company works on and uses, you can make sure that every time in the whitelist, say, I don't want to collect this. Next time you run LogMD, it won't collect it. IP connections. Now this is really cool because if you turn Windows Firewall on, we give you not only all the connections that occurred on the box, but we separate them into browsers and non-browsers. The reason that's important, most malware does not use the browser to communicate. Though I see a lot of it, Vautrac uses it, Drydex used it. Um, usually they do all browser or they don't, but most does not. It's command line stuff. And so we split those connections out to make it easier to look at. And with the new LogMD Pro version, we look up all the who is data. So when you see the IPs, we're telling you the country, the owner, the network, everything you need to know. So just by looking at the IP data itself, you can see US, 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 Russia, 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 Russia. It's pretty impressive. I'll show you that in a second. Oops. 
Wrong OS. It's often that malware will affect a 32-bit system designed for 64-bit or vice versa, and it throws an error in the log. So if you look for that condition, uh, Brian and I often will detonate this stuff in the, in the lab, in the malware lab, we're like, it didn't do anything. Well, it turns out it didn't do anything because it was on the wrong operating system. They sent us 32-bit or didn't do their, their coding correctly. And so it throws these errors. So anytime we see these reports that are populated with something above zero, we know there's something in them. And that's why we show you the byte size of the file. Task scheduler. Now, because Microsoft's moved everything from MS Startup to Task Scheduler, it's important to understand which scheduled tasks that they might have added. This is heavily used in APT, and Commodity Mower is utilizing this now, too. So they don't need to use a run key. They'll just create a task that starts every day at noon to start their malware, or once a month, that hidden back door. So it's real important to understand the, the scheduled tasks that are going on the box. Uh, the process started users. This is focused at Commodity Mower, where they're always detonating things in the user's directory structure. You lock down your user, but they're still getting ransomware. This report's designed to catch that kind of detonation. What is it that it detonated? Oh, it's called vb1359.exe. Because you've turned on the proper logging. The Windows Defender, uh, Microsoft is really expanding this in Windows 10. So we've added this report to specifically look at the triggers. Don't bother with Windows 7. You're not going to see anything good with this. But in Windows 10, I'm actually surprised every time Microsoft makes an update when we put this on the, in the malware lab, that we're actually seeing stuff in the Windows Defender log going, hey, look at there, it actually caught something. Not a, sorry, Microsoft, if you're in the room. Uh, but yay, you're doing something in Windows 10. Let's put it that way. Share access. Remember the net uses I talked about, right? Did the bad guy come to the box? Or from this box, process uh, creation 4688, did I go to another box with a net use? So we definitely want to do the shares, right? We want to make sure you see the share stick out. So did there, was there east-west lateral movement in the environment? The modules loaded false or all. Now, this requires Sysmon. Sysmon only gets collected in the pro version of LogMD. Uh, but Sysmon has a cool feature in that it tells you EXE called these DLLs or EXE called this other DXE. And it looks at the certificate of whether or not signed or not. Most malware is not signed, or if it is signed, it's some from really funky certificate. And so we give you these reports to make it easier to say, yep, these are all false. It's in a funky user location. Yeah, clearly bad. It helps you make that decision very quickly. And then WMI is a new report we're putting out there as well for Pro. WMI is something that Mandiant sees a lot of and reports quite a bit. If you've ever seen in the Mandiant talks at uh, Defer or, or uh, besides NOLA or DerbyCon, uh, WMI is dangerous because it does not log squat in Windows, but it's very, very powerful. All you'll see in a process create is WMIC space whatever the thing the guy typed. There are no logs for WMI. But again, in Windows 10 and 2016 server, there is a WMI uh, activities uh, uh, log as well now, and you're able to catch some of this in, in one of the logs, in the operational log. That's what I was looking for. And of course, PowerShell. It's a text file, not a CSV. The reason they're CSVs, we actually have a client that takes our CSVs and sucks those into their log management. Uh, the reason for that was they have a slow link, and the agents wouldn't reliably send data, and so they collect the stuff with LogMD, and they send the zipped up, they wrote a cron job or whatever the heck they wrote, and they send them over the wire, and then they open them up, and they ingest them as files into, into uh, their Splunk environment or whatever log management they use. And that's one of the reasons we have CSVs, is so you can actually use that instead of a logging agent. The text file, PowerShell, because PowerShell has these blobs, 4104 events have these big blobs of data, so there's no really good way to format them. They're not like normal Windows logs, and Microsoft has said they're not going to do it. They're going to force you to use their advanced analytics uh, product to format these, uh, these PowerShell logs. So they're kind of ugly, and right now they're in text format, but we are working at, at uh, parsing out the important tidbits, the things that Ben 10 showed, and, and some of the Mandiant guys showed at DerbyCon, for example. We have some good ideas of how to make what they do stick out. And so you get a summary of that information. So the purpose, the initial purpose was a malware lab. I wanted to be able to speed up analysis in a malware. I got a clean box, I know exactly what it does, I baselined it, I'm going to infect it, and then I'm going to do a diff, I'm going to say what's going on with it. And do it all command line so I can distribute it with Big Fix or, or PowerShell or PS Exec or whatever I want to use. Investigate a suspect system, audit the Windows Advanced Audit Policies, help move or push security forward is the big thing here, right? How many people here didn't know what to set until this talk? That's the whole point here. Now I know what to set. How do I check for it? Log MD, right? So the whole goal here is to move or push security forward. And of course, give people like me the information I need, the case where I, I called somebody and gave them a tool, and, and they give me some reports back, and now I can start before I ever get on site. 
You can get the full system file in Red Snapshot. So we actually wrote the tool to replace Red Shot as well as SHA-1 Deep or SHA-64 Deep, whichever one you want to use. Um, we do a full baseline file hash snapshot of the box and allow you to do diffs of it. Also with a registry snapshot because that's how we're looking for the null bytes and the large reg keys. We also look for large reg keys. All these payloads that go into the registry are really large. There are only about 20 keys that are over 20K. These payloads are 256K. So looking for large keys is an easy indicator to look for. You can whitelist out the normal ones and run this regularly in an environment. And if you see a big key, investigate it. And again, deploy it any way you want because it's command line. No more GUI. Red shots of GUI. It's not really good for us IR people to script. And again, answer the question. Is the system cleaned or is it infected? And to do it very quickly. The free edition gives you 12 reports. Audit your settings is free, so you can all use this. I hope and expect all of you to get a big spike of downloads, being it's free. I believe in the model that Burp Suite started. Uh, all their initial Burp Suite tools free, and then they charge you for a premium for a, a side part when they do the scanning. We like that model because how many people here know and use Burp Suite? Probably a fair amount. Um, so we like that model. We built it and designed it based on the same model. Premium does work in our industry. So you can do a full snapshot of the system. Uh, again, these reports are noisy because that means every file that's different, including non-executables, are in this. But again, we're providing you these sub-reports to help speed up your analysis. So both file system hashing as well as registry. And then, of course, uh, large rich keys. So that's the base of what LogMD Free does. So now you know what to set, how to set it, and you now know how to look up a system. All for free. Professional is now up to 23 reports. We added a couple more. Uh, one of the reports we just added is interesting artifacts. Interesting artifacts in this case detects the talk that Dennis Maldonado did at DEF CON about sticky keys. If you're not familiar with the sticky keys exploit, this is where if I boot a system, by the way, if you ever forget your password on, on a Windows box, this is how you get it back. You boot on a Windows disk, you go to repair and recovery, go to the DOS prompt, change the drive letter to D, go to Windows System 32, and copy command.exe over sethc.exe, sethenrycharlie.exe. When you reboot your system, you hit the shift key five times, a system level command prompt will come up, and then you can type in your and change your administrator password. Just that easy. So the bad guys exploit this remotely as part of their payloads when they detonate the box. So we look for this condition. Because one of the things Dennis pointed out in the DEF CON talk was that he was able to go on, on engagements to do pen tests, and the boxes were already compromised. And so he pointed out that people should look for this condition. And I'm like, I'm sitting in the front row, he's a friend of mine, I'm like, I completely agree. Guess what's going to be in the next version of LogMD? So we have a 23rd report. We harvest Sysmon logs. This is an additional service that Microsoft provides for free. Gives you all kinds of additional information, uh, hashes of the files, things like that. Great for a malware, great for investigations. Don't run it in production. Uh, it is an additional service. It generates a lot of data. Um, and if you don't set it up, some AVs, by the way, don't like it. So be wary, Larry, when you, when you first test Sysmon, that you exclude it from your AV or you will hose and just lock up the box. But it is powerful for incident response. Because I can load this service, it can collect all that hash signature information, all the hashes about the files that are detonating. It, it's a wonderful tool. And we give you, uh, uh, for free, uh, one year we give you free updates. And then a manual, there's a nice detailed manual about LogMD Professional. It's only 300 bucks. It's cheap for admin. I don't care if you have 10,000 users or 100,000 users. Whatever admin's using, it's 300 bucks. Also, we're going to give more details on PowerShell, the stuff that I talked about Ben 10 and, and gang doing. Um, this stuff is going to hit us hard. This is the new mode. There is now ransomware using only PowerShell. And that means you're going to get no logging except for the initial execution in the command line when they detonated or the user clicked on it, and that's it. Uh, we've integrated, uh, we've got permission to integrate VirusTotal. So we're going to give you the ability to take those hashes that you collect with LogMD, send them to VirusTotal free, four per minute. So warning, four per minute. If you have a thousand files, do the math. Uh, you're talking about basically going home for the night and coming back, and it might be done in the morning. Um, we're also going to look for parentless processes. This is a big thing. The dropper loads and executes. A lot of people call this stage zero. That deletes and goes away, but the remnant, the, the child that it called, is sitting there running. It's parentless. In Windows, there is a hierarchy of how things execute. Being parentless is very suspicious. Not uncommon, but very suspicious. So we're going to make that stick out in our reports as well. As well as all services running, we'll make a whitelist of that information. And then the virus total lookups as well. You'll be able to, we're required now to have an option to send files. So you'll have to do that at the command line. A lot of people in labs can't do any kind of internet connectivity, so it will be an option for you at the command line. And then other API calls uh, to vendors like last line. So you'll be able to send your payloads up to last line 
if you have an account with last line and detonate them and get the report data back for LogMD. Our goal is efficient, better logging, malicious discovery. These guys already do this, this stuff really good, so just utilize those services. And also one that's going to do reverse engineering out of Israel. So you'll be able to send your payloads, they'll reverse engineer it and send you back. This will be more appropriate for uh, uh, high-end API, uh, uh, people that use high-end API stuff for uh, advanced attacks. And again, uh, we, just delete, we just released the Whois improvements for uh, LogMD Pro. So now if you're doing the Windows Firewall or Sysmon IP collection, uh, you'll be able to see the Whois information right in the report as it's run. Just use a, type in a minus W when you run LogMD. Awesome. So here's an example of it. Here's the IP address normally in the Windows Firewall would collect you. But now you get the owner, the network name, the country of origin. In this case, you can see there's U.S. above it and Russian below it. Uh, once you zoom in on this, you can read it. People in front can read this. People in the back, you'll have to read the, watch the Prezzo later or download it. Um, and then it tells you uh, the range. So we give you the IP subnet range. Why? If you see this coming from Russia and you determine it's bad, maybe you're going to employ uh, blocking on your firewalls and or web solutions. So we're giving you that range to be able to make the decision to block it. Or maybe you'll splunk the entire site or it's up to you. But that's a new piece of information. I can now look at this report and immediately know, yeah, that's not good. And here also which uh, registrar uh, gave us the information, Aaron or, or Ripe or whomever. And this happens to be a Vautrac infection. And you can see Russia has circled. So I now know, yeah, my malware lab, malware lab should not be talking to Russia. So this executable on the right, in this case Winhost32, is clearly bad. Bam. Right? And that's how easy it was. So let's look at some, let's look at some results. Crypto event. Uh, boring thing to analyze, by the way. Crypto events are boring because they detonate something in crypto files and that's all it does. But you can see in the case, it's bigger. I blew it up on the bottom because it's hard to read. Uh, it detonated an item, Bob, app data roaming. Again, name of a, a binary and roaming is a really bad idea. It uh, executed a deletion of the original payload. So it detonated, dropped a, a copy of it somewhere else and then deleted the original copy, which you can see there, and then it deleted the volume shadow copy. That's pretty much what all crypto events look like in the logs. Pretty straightforward. But you now know where the file is. The guy sitting next to me in the ransomware talk said, yeah, but how do I know that, that binary isn't doing something else like sniffing passwords? Because we know they're starting to do that. Well, this would allow you to say, ah, I know where the binaries are, let's go delete them. And now you can clean up the box and restore the data if you uh, so have backups. Here's a malicious Word document. This is a Drydex payload. Uh, the document executing, dropping these bat files. These come out of the early example of a commodity. Pinging China to make sure I have network connectivity. They're looking to make sure they're not being analyzed in the lab. They're then detonating the, the payload and pinging again to make sure they still have network connect, connect, uh, connectivity. And this is Drydex. Here's the Windows firewall logs for it without the Whois information. So now you can see the, and understand why the Whois is so much more important. I can see that when we're talked to a foreign IP, I can see when we're talked to an IP. I don't know if it's foreign or not. So my post analysis was to look these up with who is or whose IP by Nearsoft to get that information, which is why we integrated into LogMD. So great, WinWord should never talk to anything but Microsoft. So if it's talking to anything other than Microsoft, you know it's bad. And CScript should never talk to anything external unless you wrote the script and you know it's supposed to talk to the internet. But generally, CScript runs BB script files. And so again, if it's talking to an IP address, it's very suspect. The Whois information would be really handy here. Um, but at this point, we didn't have it, so I wanted to make sure you, you saw both. And so that's, again, Drydex. Now, we made them in CSVs because Excel is the number one security tool. All of us use it. All security tools export to it. Why? Filtering, sorting, coloring, highlighting, parsing. Make that final fancy report for your management to say, here's what happened, where, how, whatever. Include into your quarterlies, etc. So there's no reason to redesign an interface. Use Excel. It's really, really powerful, and it can open some really big files. If we get to the point where we're collecting files, and the reasons why we only collect seven days, one to seven days with LogMD, if you get to the point you're collecting really big files, uh, we plan to figure out where that, that delta is and chop off the reports, and we'll make two of them, like report one, report two. So you shouldn't have to worry about uh, opening a file that's too big for, for Excel. But the filtering and all that is awesome. So it allows you to manipulate the data any way you see fit. And for those oddball cases like uh, PowerShell, we're using text files. So use Notepad++ to do compares or your favorite text editor. It doesn't really matter. 
So what does this get us? Well, we know what processes get executed. We know where they got executed from. We know the IPs to enter into log management or network or ask the network guys, hey, we got these IPs. Who else visited them because they're probably infected? We know who else opened the malware because of those IPs and, and where they visited. And we have the details now to remediate the system. We know that we can clean the system or that we have to reimage the system because it's just too messed up, right? And all the details to improve your active defense. When you start seeing the output from things like LogMD or good logging and log management, doesn't matter what you do, do both, please. Um, again, it allows you to make tweaks to your defenses and go improve things you might look for in your Nessus scanner or, or Nexpo scanner, whichever you're using, or you might go tweak uh, uh, inventory in SSCM, or what I do is tweak analysis and big fix. Um, I, this really is a very teaching environment in regards to looking at these logs and seeing what these new malwares did. And those reports I showed you, I generated them in 15 minutes. It's a very fast process. So if you practice on your home system, your work PC, when it comes time to investigate a real system, like I'm going to go do with my parents' PC here uh, this weekend, um, I get really quick at it. I can rip through these reports and I know exactly what I'm looking for. And the report that we create helps do that. All right, so we got that information. Oop, went backwards. So here's the resources. Again, log-md.com. Log Not log doctor, but log malicious discovery. It is imfsecurity.com. That's our company, IMF Security. Anybody care to guess what the IMF is, stands for? Do, 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 do. No, it means I'm, I'm frickin' security, IMF, I'm frickin' security. Yeah, that's how we came up with the name. And again, some, uh, I have some detailed analysis reports out there on my website. So I won't say, hey, where do I get a big list of malware reports? I definitely follow the IR guys from Mandiant and SecureWorks and all those for sure. But when I see a good report that I think is interesting, I will post them on my website. So it's a great place for resources as well. And again, the cheat sheets on malwarearchaeology.com. And you can find it in Google. It'll help you spell it because not everybody spells archaeology. And there's the cheat sheet that shows up. It's going to be the number one hit, so it's easy to find. Uh-oh. Did someone mess with me? It's Squarespace. Don't, don't look at me. It's Squarespace. That's awesome. Really? Someone's, I'll have an alert on my phone, so I'll have to check. That's funny. There you go. I didn't have to demo that one. Talk to Squarespace. It's a Squarespace site. That's why I use a provider like Squarespace. Questions? I do have some t-shirts to give away. The find your back doors for the feds, knock on them, as well as the Krebs, don't be on Krebs list. So compelling questions, you'll be rewarded with the shirt. Yes? All right, so... Uh, the question was, there's an increase in PowerShell that we're seeing, so what's my opinion on having uh, signed scripts? It doesn't matter, because everything Microsoft implements, they always implement a bypass for it. So for the most part, it's a great idea. Hardly anybody who does it. There are some houses that do use signed scripts. So if you can do that, and it's easy for an organization to digest, then by, by all means, do it. Uh, but for the most part, it, it's hard for most organizations. So if you can, go for it. If you can't, then you might want to find a different way. Execution policy does not matter, right? It can be bypassed. Just do a, a you know, a NOP, minus NOP, and you, the execution policy goes out the window. So good question. What size shirt? Large. What, uh, Krebs or, Craig, you have a, Craig's or back door? So you have a large back door. Really? Come on now. Grown. I set you up big time on that one. All right, another question. Yes, in the middle. Uh, not yet. So the question was, uh, there are a lot of resources for Windows logging. Uh, yes, are there any for other OSs like Mac OS or Linux? No. A friend of mine is working on a Mac OS ch cheat sheet. Um, so at some point it will come across. Uh, but right now the Windows target is so ginormous uh, but at some point, it is a long-term plan of ours to, to go down that route. Or solicit volunteers to help us create one would even be better. It's a good question. What shirt? Don't have any medium. I got large, extra large, and 2XL. Sorry. So out of luck. All right, other questions? Can I get some lights so I can actually see? Because I cannot see squat. Anybody else got any questions? I will be available to grab. I do have more shirts. Good question. Get a shirt. All right, we're at uh, three minutes, so uh, 
Thanks for attending, and I hope you guys do some homework, because this, this talk does have homework. And see me for any questions afterwards.